In car news elsewhere, we have Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Um, basically, I've uh, the, the article is specifically about Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram overcharging customers in order to buy their cars. So let me, um, uh, I'm going to not divert. I just want to read off the key points. Car buyers are looking for the best way to get the best deal these days. Certain brands have had larger increases in monthly payments since the pandemic started. Experts say to look out for those brands and what those prices could mean in a recession. Consumers in the car buying market are in luck with the price of certain vehicle brands this year. There's no question that car buying has proven difficult over the past few years, driven by the pandemic and chip shortage that left new and used vehicle inventory low and the prices of these cars high. First of all, let me stop right there. Notice how there's no smoke since that's the new term everybody uses. Notice how there's no smoke thrown towards government for printing out all those goddamn welfare checks. See, what people don't understand, because as you know, when we go to school now, they don't, I, and I, I refuse to say they don't teach about it. What I will say is these kids aren't learning about it because they're busy on their fucking TikTok and they're paying no attention to what their teachers are explaining to them. When I was in high school, I learned about overprinting of money causing inflation. I learned about the Weimar Republic. This is no different than what happened to them. You know, it's funny, Germany and the Weimar Republic, and then when you fast forward, you get Zimbabwe and overprinting of money, which made it so that they had these ridiculously high uh, denomination bills. And now you're looking at America where we overprinted welfare and we were handing out these stimulus checks, which is nothing new because Bush had done the same thing. Bush Jr. had sent out these $600 stimulus checks. And I learned then that sending out money like that didn't work. People took those checks and saved them. The whole point of Bush putting that money out was for people to spend that money. Most people, because of the uncertainty... They did their best to save that money. But this was a totally different time. This was before we had five and $600 cell phones. This was before uh, people were spending top dollar on Jordan sneakers and stuff. You know, a lot of people who got those checks saved that money. Or there were many people who, because of their tax withholding, I remember specifically, they were supposed to get $600. They never got that full amount of money. I say that to say this. We allowed the government to drive up demand by printing money. That is ultimately, along with the poor response to COVID, what caused us to have this, they call it an auto crisis. I don't see that there's a real crisis because when you really look at it, there were people who rushed out and bought these cars, overpaid on them. There were a lot of these dealers who bought these cars, overpaid on them. There were a lot of auctioneers who bought these cars, overpaid on them. But I don't really see that being a crisis because the reality is those cars can be taken back and it's not really that big of a deal. The people who lost their money, they can just as easily save up and probably buy something cheaper. It's not like a housing crisis. The housing crisis was a real crisis. But even that was temporary because what did the government do? They printed their way out of it. They gave out bailouts. They printed money. So the thing about it is they won't even let a crisis really happen. And I, I think a lot of people are understanding that, which is the reason why um, the stock market has been so inflated. It's because people realize that the government's not going to let any of these companies go out of business. There are a few small companies that they'll let go out of business, but they're not going to let the large factory, automotive, uh, aviation, they're not letting them go out of business. And that's the reason why people who are willing to invest in these things, they don't lose their money as long as they get in while they're down. But um, let me not divert. Let me get back to it. It says, experts say to look out for these brands and what those prices could mean in recession. Consumers in the car buying market are in luck. With the price of certain vehicle brands this year, there's no question that car buying has proven difficult over the past few years, driven by the pandemic chip shortage. That left new and used vehicle inventory low and the prices of these cars high. Those dynamics meant car buyers weren't likely to find what they were looking for on dealership lots and might have had to overpay for a vehicle that didn't have the features they wanted. 
I made many videos about that. You go to the dealership, they had uh, manual seats. They didn't have heated and cooled seats in a lot of these cars. They didn't have the, uh, what was it? They, there was chips that controlled uh, things like the moon roof, uh, that controlled the television screens. They didn't have all those features simply because they didn't have enough chips. So I made a lot of videos about that over the last couple of years. Um, some of that is starting to normalize as inventory replenishes and prices creep down. But one of the key factors to consider, especially as the challenging economic environment persists, might be vehicle brand. Cox Automotive senior economist Charlie Chespero said at a recent Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago annual auto insight symposium in Detroit. Between March 2020 and December 2020, average monthly loan payments jumped about 29%. According to dealer track data Chespero shared, the average was $785 for a loan in December. It's not the same for all different manufacturers, Chesbro said. Not everybody had risen their monthly payments in quite that amount. Uh, homegrown automakers like Ford and GM accounted for eight of the top 10 brands with the largest increases in those payments during that period. That means that of the vehicle brands that got more expensive since the pandemic began, Detroit-based brands are the top culprits, including Dodge and specifically Dodge. Why? And we already know why. It's because of the SRT vehicles, the Hellcats, the, not really the Demons, those were all sold out. But the Hellcats and the SRT Scat Packs and the, uh, what was it called? The um, other Hemi V8 cars. With an average 44.5% increase, GM at 44%, Jeep at 42%, Cadillac at 39%, and Ford at 36%. Their customers are going to be in for a big surprise when they come in to buy their next product from them. Alfa Romeo, Mini, Subaru, Jaguar, Audi, Kia, Mercedes, Infiniti, Toyota, and Genesis made up the 10 brands with the lowest increases in their average monthly payments over the same period. Alfa only saw a 9% increase, and Genesis was 21%. Well, you also have to understand there's a reason for that. Just about every single one of these companies they named had very aggressive leasing, for one. When you're talking about Mercedes-Benz, Infiniti, in order to buy those cars and have even a reasonable payment, you have to either put a sizable amount down, you have to have excellent credit, and chances are when you buy one of those cars, you'll lease them. They had very aggressive leasing on those cars. The issue with Dodge is Dodge did not have very aggressive leasing. What they ultimately were doing during it depended when you were buying it, but what they were doing was they were using uh, rebates in order to lower prices up until a certain point on certain cars. However, when you're talking about those SRT cars and those V8 Hemi cars, they were fucking raising the prices like crazy. I mean, they were putting ten thousand. Well, I, I made videos about it. They were putting ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollar market adjustments on these cars. Um, well, that that's just what it is. Alfa Romeo, those cars aren't fucking selling. I have an Alfa Romeo dealership about 10 miles away from me. And that Alfa Romeo dealership, every time you go there, their lot is filled with cars. Nobody wants them. They also sell Fiat not far away from me. Guess what? Those lots are filled with cars. Nobody wants them. In order to sell those cars, they have to have aggressive leasing. Many. How many people do you know out there buying minis? The only person I even personally know who has a mini, uh, it's like she shares it with her husband because they drive manual, and she claims that that's the reason why, you know, that's the car that they choose to use. But the reality is they're spending so much money putting their kids through school until they just didn't have that much more money. So they decided to get an inexpensive car to use that they could both drive. But the reality is, Nobody's fucking buying minis in mass. Those cars are too small. Americans don't want them. Who look up? Look what else? Subaru. Subaru does sell decently when it comes to those Outbacks and the. Um, I haven't really seen many cross trucks lately, but the Outbacks, uh, the uh, Rainbow Flag crowd loves those, especially the women. So yeah, those sell pretty well. Kia, yeah. Genesis, yeah, they sell okay, especially when people needed a three-row. They were going after that GV80. 
Uh, and they went after the Kia Telluride. That's another important thing. Kia Telluride, GV80, GV70. Um, what else? Uh, Toyota. Yeah, well, Toyota's always going to sell. The Camry was a, a, a number one pick of the Uber driver here in New York. But let's get down to Dodge. <laughs> I want to get down to where it talks about Dodge specifically. Wait, 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 wait. Where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, it's uh, that doesn't necessarily mean consumers shouldn't buy from certain automakers. The domestic brands, despite those increases, might actually have more inventory now than others. Well, that's because they make them, uh, you know, locally. Uh, some of the engines come from Mexico. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of the story here. Um, I thought they were going to go a little bit deeper into Dodge and Chrysler, but what ended up happening apparently is they only looked at the numbers, but they didn't try to explain why. Right away, you already know why, and that's what I'm explaining now. They were over-marking these cars like crazy. And all these dudes, these fuckboys, all these dudes were desperate to buy these damn cars, these scat packs, these fucking... Hellcats, they were sign anything to get themselves into those cars. They don't care if it's a ninja loan. They, you can tell them it's going to be a 12.8% interest and they're ready to sign. That's how bad it is. It's like they don't even try to fight because they know most of them got bad credit. So the issue is the markups on these cars are astounding. See, the problem is most of these dudes, they go into these dealerships. They don't have loan calculators. They're not going in there crunching numbers. They're going in there desperate to drive out of there in one of those damn cars. And then they can get started on a, a, a near future of extremely high monthly maintenance payments. But they ain't worried about that. They ain't worried about that when they pull up to the trap house or when they pull up to the dollar menu meet driving one of those cars. That they're desperate to get those cars. This is also part of the reason why I kept saying the Dodge Banshee SRT electric concept. That thing is going to flop. These dudes don't want those cars. What they want is they want loud uh, burnout ability, uh, aggressive sound and all that. There's a lot of ego wrapped up in this stuff. And, and that's what a lot. Nobody addresses that. I've, I know it because I was there. There's so much ego wrapped up in these things until people are willing to pay whatever you tell them to pay. When these dealers are talking ten and twenty and thirty thousand dollars over sticker, and they're getting away with selling uh, scat packs for the price of Hellcats, and when they're getting away with selling Hellcats for the price of demons, it's disgusting. And the sad thing about it is, the insurance companies, if something happens to those cars. The insurance company is only insuring those cars to the MSRP. They're not insuring those cars for the overcharge. So that means that you literally lose all of the money that you overpaid on the sticker. It's disgusting. It's really disgusting. And the, the proper answer to this would be for banks to refuse to pay a loan over the sticker. But the banks aren't going to do that because... After all, the government backs up their loans, so they're not worried about it because at the end of the day, they're not going to lose money, and the government will just go another trillion dollars into debt, and they'll just have Republicans blaming Democrats, Democrats blaming Republicans, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it, that, that's where you are. You have to remember something about the term stagflation. Stagflation is caused by recession. It's caused by underemployment which is also unemployment, because if you're underemployed, chances are you're not earning enough money to just work one job and be able to make ends meet. So you're underemployed. Chances are you might be working a job, they're not paying health insurance. That's underemployment. Unemployment is you're not working a job at all, which most people at this point can't afford to do because they'd straight up be homeless at this point. So most people end up being underemployed, which is actually more dangerous than being unemployed. Then on top of that, you have sinking GDP. Our government lies about the GDP numbers, so I, basically you can believe whatever they tell you, but the reality is they lie. 
But on top of that, one of the biggest problems with stagflation and one of the things they don't talk about is poor government policies. When you have poor government policies, when you react to a recession by printing money, well, that's just what you get. Now, here is the real story right here. And this plays right in to what's going on in the used car and the new car market. This plays in in a very, very interesting way. Now, personally, if you take these stories and you isolate them, it doesn't tell you the whole picture. But when you take these stories and you paint a larger picture using these individual stories, then you start to understand that all of this, all of this auto industry craziness is coming back to the fact that the government overprinted Stimulus checks. Some people took those stimulus checks and used them as a down payment on a Tesla. Some of those people took those stimulus checks and used them on a down payment on the next car. It's, it's not even that different than what we did with cash for clunkers. And I, I keep making this comment during cash for clunkers. The whole point, Obama and Biden, the whole point of cash for clunkers was to pay you to take the old cars off the roads and to replace them with slightly newer cars. What did Cash for Clunkers do? Cash for Clunkers caused the dealers to raise prices on their existing inventory. And people like my uncles were out there actively searching for clunkers rather than searching for new cars. And what ended up happening was a lot of people, what they did was they uh, went to dealers and the dealers abused them by raising prices. And a lot of that government money got swallowed. A lot of it got stolen. But um, with Elon Musk, Elon Musk, you know, I kind of have had mixed feelings about Elon Musk. But I always knew exactly what he was. In my opinion, Elon Musk was a government-subsidized welfare queen. I call him a government-subsidized Frankenstein. Now, if you know about the story of Frankenstein... One of the things you got to remember about Frankenstein is the first thing that Frankenstein did after he was created was he started, he turned on his creator. He attacked the village people. He turned on Dr. Frankenstein's immediate close relatives and family and his wife. So the issue ultimately is they put this guy together. They hyped this guy up. Everybody, all these goddamn liberals were singing the praises of Elon Musk. And I said it numerous times in my videos. I was like, you know what? Tesla is a cult of personality. And I've seen so many cult of personalities and you know them right away when you see them. Even Apple. Apple was a cult of personality around Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs died. Now you got that guy, Tim Cook. They ain't nobody following behind Tim Cook. This isn't about Tim Cook. This is about Steve Jobs. It's so sad because you never, ever, ever have the ability to become the new head of a cult of personality. That's part of the reason why Elon can't step down from Tesla because he is Tesla. He's the face of it. Government subsidies hooked him up. They were the things that started these uh, uh, charging spots, these green lanes, HOV lanes. It's like we've been subsidizing the rich for so long because the rich were the main people buying these cars. The Model 3 and the Model Y is what got, I'll say, middle class people able to buy Tesla. Now on the streets around here, especially, you see lots and lots of Model 3s and Model Ys. My new complaint became that the interior on those cars sucked. They look nice to me on the outside. I like the way they look. But on the inside, I consider them small. And I consider the interiors uncomfortable. And I consider the interiors flat, lifeless, and boring. At this point, a lot of people are dumping these cars on the market. Now, there's... A couple of main reasons for that. First of all, the cars are really appliances. And when I say appliances, Tesla's cars are no different than Camry's. They're no different than Accord's. They're appliances. They're boring. They're lifeless. Their job is to get you from point A to point B, hopefully without breaking down, hopefully without bursting into flames, hopefully without running into another car when you have it on autopilot. They're appliances. 
there's nothing special about them. It's not like, say, a Mercedes EQS or EQS SUV or BMW i7 or BMW iX. It's nothing like that. A Tesla is made damn near so that when you get ready to sell it as a used car, all they got to do is wipe down the interior and wipe your stains off of the seats. And then they can put in a brand new battery and sell it as if it's damn near a brand new car. That's what the, that's what the ultimate goal in those cars is. They have a couple of problems. They're boring at this point. Some people still want them, but for the most part, they're boring. Number two, the competition is offering so much more. I am still, as you know, waiting for my electric Cadillac. My electric Cadillac technically costs less than a Tesla Model Y performance or even a Model 3 performance because thanks to the welfare checks and the stimulus, the prices on these cars have been inflated by a tremendous amount. I believe the inflation margin has probably been between 10 and 15 percent. However, because of the uh, long wait times that Tesla had promised, that inflation has ha had grown considerably more. And people were willing to pay it because if you were willing to pay more, the weight dropped to zero. You were able to just go get it. Here's the problem now. Because of the government still pumping out tax credits, still subsidizing, Tesla, what they had announced that they were going to do, they had announced that they were going to drop $7,500 off of the car since they couldn't get any more government tax credits. That's what they claimed that they were going to do. Here's the problem, though. What happens if you just went out and bought your Tesla brand new after waiting all this time and you got your Tesla brand new and you paid full price? Well, you'd feel like an absolute idiot if you drove out of Tesla in your brand new Tesla only to find out two or three days later that they were dropping the price. So anyway, let's get to the story real quick. It says Marion Simmons, a self-professed Tesla fan girl, bought her second electric vehicle from the company in September, a white, high-performance Model Y ringing in at more than $77,000. And by the way, my Cadillac all-wheel drive Lyric is going to have like 500-something horsepower, and even with taxes, it's only going to be like 70000 then the company slashed prices on Thursday, and she realized she could have bought the same car today at $13,000 less. I feel like I got duped. I feel like I got taken. You've been had. You've been hoodwinked. You've been led astray, run amok. Remember that? You've been hoodwinked. <laughs> A web designer in Naples, Florida, right off the bat, I'm out of $13,306. It's such a large reduction that it's going to affect a lot of people who just bought a vehicle. That's the reality facing owners of Tesla Incorporated. Vehicles after the company cut the price of its cars as much as 20%. Part of a push from Chief Executive Officer Elon Musk to increase sales volume in the face of weakening demand. For existing companies, Customers, the resale value of the cars they own will take a hit along with the drop in prices of new models. Before I keep on going, let me just say this. This, in my opinion, should be a scandal. And considering the media isn't happy with Elon for ruining the propaganda wing that they had over at Tesla, the way I see it, and I, you know, you never know who's listening, but the way I see it is the one way that Musk could redeem himself for this is basically to offer free self-driving, full self-driving, to offer free self-driving to everybody who just bought one of these cars and who didn't pay for self-driving or to give them a rebate for it. Uh, free self-driving, the price of it kept getting pushed up. I believe the last time I checked, the price was like 8000 or more. So the one, if I was him, as CEO, the one way I think that I could regain their, I guess you could say regain their trust or to, you know, you know, mitigate 
the anger that they're feeling because they got fucked up and ripped off. I think the best thing you could do is to say, okay, well, I'm going to give you free self-driving. But see, this has been my problem with Tesla from the very beginning. And this is the reason why I, was, I always had a tepid relationship with their stock. Even, even when I made a lot of money off their stock, it was really hard for me to ever promote their stock. And it was really hard for me to promote buying their cars. Tesla, to me, always felt like a fly-by-night operation. I showed you the galleries that they had. They had one in Roosevelt Field. They had one in Syosset. That one disappeared. Then it went elsewhere. It went to Americana, Manhasset. And the problem, like, I, I never feel comfortable when there's a business and every time I go to it, it's changed radically. I never feel comfortable like that, especially if it's a car dealer. Here's the problem, though. Tesla doesn't do car dealers. We're used to saying car dealership because we're used to buying cars from dealerships. Tesla doesn't have that. They have galleries. It's funny to me because the Carvana uh, vending machine that you know they put together, it seems to me that the Carvana vending machine actually would work good for Tesla if... Tesla had vending machines or if they took over the Carvano vending machines. Because the funny thing about it is there's so few options for Tesla when you really think about it that it's like if they – like for instance, if they had a vending machine selling um, uh, the most popular colors of Teslas like black and white, right? If they loaded those cars up or if they kept a couple of base models in that vending machine and they had a couple of base models, they had a couple of loaded models, it's like anybody who's looking for one of those cars, they would just go to the vending machine and buy it out of the vending machine, those gigantic vending machine buildings. The problem is that that I, I, I don't know the logistics behind those vending machines. Like right now, the ones that do exist, they're pretty much empty because Carvana is basically bankrupt. But... That model, if you're not going to have a dealership, that model where you could just buy like a coin or something and then put the coin in and then the car comes out, rolled out to you by the vending machine, that vending machine model seems to me it would work well with Tesla's vehicles considering how few options that those things actually have or, or how optioned out they could be. But... I don't even think right now Tesla's got that on their minds. It's like they'd rather just do their deliveries at their uh, the galleries that they have, you know. It says, for any existing owner, it's a kick in the teeth. Uh, anyone who bought a Tesla recently will feel an immediate impact Wish and wish they had leased it for the most part. Drewy said the new vehicle price cuts will hit used cars immediately and could lower values even further. New car buyers want new car smell. New, uh, he said, uh, pre-owned prices could fall more. So what's going to end up happening is you may end up seeing a lot of people sell, if they haven't already, their Model 3 and upgrade to a Model Y. It also means that if the prices have been decreased on the Model X and the Model S, that a lot of people may opt to go from a Model Y up to a Model X if they can afford it. But then there's also a lot of people who are political and they don't like Elon Musk because he came out as a conservative. And that's something that I always expected because when I saw him angry at California during COVID and how he was claiming that he was going to move to Texas and everything, I always knew right away. I was like, you know what? He's going to shift his political position and he's going to announce that he's basically a Republican because when you move your businesses to Texas, you are basically conceding that a red state with low taxation and less unions, you're basically conceding that they're right. And California, as you've known, homelessness is up. They're always having environmental problems with flooding. They're always having environmental problems with forests burning down. Basically, when you leave California and you move somewhere else, you're basically conceding that that red state had it right and you were wrong all along. Same thing happens here in New York. When people can't afford New York because they've the liberal policies have made taxation high and the illegal immigrants we're bringing in, they're getting the best of your tax money, what do they do? They move down to Atlanta, Georgia. 
And then they turn that from red to blue. Uh, or they move down to Florida. And then they gradually turn that from red to blue. Or they move out to Ohio. Or they move out to, where else they move? Uh, Denver. Yeah, it's like, that's what you're dealing with. It's like poor government policies. That is the major part of stagflation that nobody talks about. All right, it says this age-old problem in the car business. Consumers buy a vehicle only to see a rebrand advertised days later that would have saved them a few thousand dollars. This time, it's different because dealer discounts are often limited time sales, and Tesla's cuts are larger than the typical rebate. In fairness, Simmons and other Tesla fans aren't the only car buyers who will see their resale values fall. Used model pricing fell 15% in December, while new ones hit a record average of nearly $50,000, according to researcher Cox Automotive. Tesla price cuts have been the biggest among new car sellers. Its more expensive models took the biggest hit. Model Y base prices are down 20% to start a f at $53,000. The performance edition of the car was brought down 19%. The larger Model S sedan plaid edition was cut 14%. The plaid. I, I always say plaid. It's plaid. Austin Flack, a producer... Uh, in Los Angeles says he listed his 2018 Model 3 with the full self-driving beta software package for around 51000 but slashed that price to 36000 as Tesla unloaded incentives near the end of the year. He said he'll likely have to cut the price again to $30,000. Now, you know what? This thing goes on and on and on and on about the same exact thing, so I'm not going to read all of the rest. So what is the bottom line here? Well, first of all, if you're a parent and you need to buy your kid their first car, frankly, I don't believe in buying kids their first car. I think they should have to work for it. That's what I think. But most of you parents, you know, you'll do it your way and you'll just, you know, spoil your kids. But uh, my thing is, I think a Tesla, a Model 3 or a Model Y is a good... Uh, family car, especially for your, uh, you know, your college grad or whatever. Um, and the reason why I believe that is because it's bound to the house or to the supercharger. So they're going to have to charge it. It doesn't use gas, obviously. The, granted, the insurance price is going to be high or higher than it normally would be on a regular car. But the thing about it is uh, there are a lot of safety features, you know, that uh, might actually help out just in case your kid gets into a car accident. Um, in fact, a lot of uh, car reviewers have looked at uh, what are those things, uh, Nissan Leafs and some of the older EVs, and they've considered those actually relatively uh, reliable and good vehicles to buy for your kid. Because, I mean, you think about it. If you, you got a kid who just started working, got out of college, college grad, this, that, and other, you know, assuming that you're buying them their first car, you want something that's safe, relatively safe, uh, can take a hit if it gets hit. You want something that's efficient. Even if they did lose a lot of uh, range due to an aging battery, the reality is your kid's not driving that far every single day. In fact, your, your kid, your son's living in your basement, your daughter's living in your attic. They're just driving back and forth between work and school or home every single day. So, you know, those cars are definitely a good option for a first car, as, or let's say if your, your wife needs a car and she just needs something nice, because most of these women love these Teslas. They don't give a shit about the price slashing and all that. They don't care. They want one of these Teslas. A lot of them want the one with the white interior. The white interior, in my, I ordered the Cadillac that I'm getting with the white interior specifically because I kind of got, I should say, a little jealous when I see these people with their Teslas and they're sitting in their Teslas and they're doing the self-driving and the traffic and they're sitting in there with their nice comfy white seats and everything, I kind of got a little jealous of that. So I ordered my Cadillac with white seats. It's a satin steel exterior, uh, all-wheel drive, 20-inch wheels, 
And, um, you know, I, I just wanted something nice. You know, I just wanted a nice electric car. That's just what I wanted. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, you should do that. But it's like, listen, if I don't like it, I'll just get something else. I have money. I'm not worried about that shit. I just want my car and I want it now. But uh, most of these women like these white interior Teslas. And they, I've, I see these women every single day on the road. They've all got like the white interiors. Like the guys get the black interior because they know it's going to get dirty. But the women are getting the luxurious white interiors with their vegan leather and their lack of heated and cooled seats. But my Cadillac's going to have heated, cooled massage seats. So I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. There are some people who probably might ask me, they'd be like, hey, you keep talking about this Cadillac, where is it? Well, if you do follow the news, they're even talking about it. It says GM wants to get Cadillac Lyric to customers faster after only 122 deliveries in 2022. Now, I am very disappointed that GM took the route that it took, but I do understand what they were doing. Ultimately, they were developing these lyrics, uh, rear-wheel drive platforms first, all-wheel drive afterwards. Then what they did was they offered a $5,000 uh, discount to the initial sales that they made, and they told these people, basically, you're going to have non-disclosure agreements. If you have problems with the car, you can only talk to us. You can't talk to anybody else. The NTHSB had a problem with that, but for the most part, they didn't go too far because Cadillac was quietly ironing out the kinks. So they wanted, when, you know, see, the, the ultimate issue is when you're getting these electric cars, range anxiety, battery capacity loss, the possibility of electronic failures, and this, that, and other, all of these things are concerns, yes, um, and all of this is relatively new technology, and uh, they're trying to iron out all of the problems. Now, here's the thing. Let's say my Lyric, let's say I get my Lyric and something goes wrong with it and it just breaks down, right? Well, if something breaks down in that Lyric, Cadillac will lend me, well, it, my, the Cadillac dealer that I'm getting the car from will lend me, say, an X-T5 or an X-T6 to drive around in up until they can fix my Lyric, Right. The downside is that I'd be without my Lyric, and that's what I want. I didn't want the X-T6. If I wanted the X-T6, what's funny, I was just uh, talking to the finance manager a few days ago. If I wanted the X-T6, the X-T6 would actually be like $15,000 less than the Lyric if I wanted it right now. If I wanted an X-T5, I could get an X-T5 with most of the features, you know, I actually, I shouldn't even say most of the features because it wouldn't have massage seats. It wouldn't have uh, the electric power and everything. It wouldn't have that powertrain. So if I wanted an X-T5, I could get an X-T5 fully loaded and it would still be less than the Lyric. I don't want those though. And I do love driving my mom's X-T5. You know, it's funny in this picture, there's a red X-T5 right back there. And uh, my mom loves, she loves her X-T5. And I want my Lyric. That's what I want. It's, it, it just hurts me so much to have to wait for something that I want. I can't just get it. it bothers me. But um, the thing about it is uh, they're talking about how they started making all-wheel drive Lyric deliveries in China. But what's so funny about that is I haven't heard any Chinese reviews of the all-wheel drive Lyric. So they have been so tight on this that they've basically made it so that you haven't heard anything. These cars are out there. The drivers have them, but they have made it so tight that you've heard nothing at all about these cars. Even right here, it says right now, GM's Albano Decide, declined to say how many lyrics the automaker has made to date other than to say there are about 500 parked at GM Spring Hill assembly plant where the vehicle's made. So the my, my car, I, it's so weird. It's like I wonder to myself right now, has my car been built? 
Is my car right now sitting on one of their lots being rained on and having wind and birds and stuff pissing and shitting on it? And Like, is my car out there? Is my car in like a big lot filled with lyrics and it's just sitting there lonely and waiting for me? It's like, is it is it built? Is it out there somewhere? I just don't know. And I, as a, a, a pre-orderer, I have heard nothing from them. They, when I ordered the car, they called me, I believe, like maybe one or two days later, and we built the car on the phone. There was barely any options to consider. The only options were what color do you want the interior? What color do you want the exterior? They didn't have red. Uh, they only had blue, silver, black, and white, if I'm not mistaken. They didn't have any red color. And uh, that was it. And then it was like, yeah, uh, if you're getting all-wheel drive, there's no choice of wheels. So you have a 20-inch wheel, which is fine by me. Because the last thing you want is to have these really, really big wheels. And then something goes wrong, like you damage a wheel. You don't want that because then the only people you can get those wheels from is Cadillac. Um, but uh, other than that, I mean, I haven't heard anything from them since I pre-ordered this damn car. And I have, I, I've never had to wait for something this long. I've never had to wait for something this long. And uh, the, But this is what it is. They're quietly ironing out problems. They're being very tight-lipped about any issues that may arise. And they're basically saying, um, they're saying it says, through October, GM claims Spring Hill produced a production of 366 units with the expectation of 166 more in November and 890 in December. Uh, it says, uh, production in China, however, is claimed to be in the 2,000 unit per month range since June. Here's my question. Has anybody in China gotten these damn things? Because I haven't seen anybody in China say anything about them. It's the weirdest thing. Now, I've heard people say that there's a lot of people who are upset that they haven't gotten their lyric and that they were canceling their order or they were going elsewhere. To tell you the truth, I don't believe that. I believe that there's a few people who may cancel their order, but for most of them, I don't believe that. I really don't. And the reason why is because the lyric operates in this very strange space between, say, the Tesla Model Y and the Tesla Model X. It's not as big as a Model X, but it's not as small as a Y. And it's the only vehicle its size that has that amount of luxury, but doesn't cost over $100,000. It's the only one. So it has a very, very strange niche that it's going to easily fill and I just want it. I just want them to hurry up and give it to me. You know, it really bothers me having to wait. But it's like I try to be patient. They say patience is a virtue. I have no idea whether or not I'll qualify for the $7,500 tax credit. Uh, the government tried to basically say the Lyric is a car. There's no way that the Lyric is a car. The Lyric is the size and the weight or mass of an SUV. In fact... That Lyric weighs more than my Jeep SRT does. So for them to say that this thing is a uh, car, that doesn't even make sense. So I think GM is also trying to help rewrite the law. Um, price, any price discounts that you currently see being made in the electric car market is being done in order to make sure they get these tax credits. But uh, that's basically that. I mean, they had a full story about this. And uh, when I saw it, I was just, I was just like, oh my God. Now I really believe that I, you know, mark my words, I really believe that I will have my lyric before uh, President's Week and President's Week is February 20th. Time is moving pretty fast. Today is January 15th. So we have 15 more days till the end of January, give or take. And then after that, you've got February, uh, February President's Week. That's when I do taxes and everything. I really believe that I'll have my lyric by President's Week, but you, you know, I, I can't be hundred percent certain. I think the latest would probably be about March first, so I'm hoping for President's Week, but it's very possible I won't get it till March first. I really can't anticipate it taking much longer than March first. 
They did say that you're supposed to be having these things by spring 2023, but they originally stated you're supposed to have it by quarter one of 2023. So, you know, this is just what it is. It's like, I'm excited. I want it. I'm anxious. I want it. I just want it. And, um, you know, that's what it is. It's like, and the, the thing about it is Cadillac, they really, I don't know what they're going to do, if they're going to do anything to make it up to people who pre-ordered and had to wait this long. Because the reality is, if I really wanted to, I could go right over to BMW right now and I could get a BMW iX. I could go over to Mercedes right now and I could get an EQS SUV. I could go over to, um, shit, I could go to Tesla right now and I could get a used Tesla. And I don't want that, but I could. You know, so it's like, I, you know, that's just what it is. But um, this car market has been an absolute disaster. And you've got nobody but the government to blame. But I don't think they're really that worried about it. Because after, you know, I already did the story about they want to come and take your oven away from you. They want to basically make you have an electric oven. They want to make all, because, and by the way, you know, it's funny. The story was about electric ovens, but when you really think about it, they're not just going to get your oven. They'll make that same case that you shouldn't have a gas dryer either. They're trying to eliminate you using gas. That's what they're trying to do. So if they're trying to do that, they'll get your oven. They'll get your uh, dryer. You won't have a gas dryer. Um, I really can't think of any other applications of gas in the house besides your dryer and your oven, but... If you do happen to have a natural gas water boiler, they're going to come get that too. They, they're basically saying that, yeah, by 2040, everything that you have is going to be electric. That's what they're saying. Is that a terrible thing? Well, if they switch to nuclear power again and they tell these liberals to shut the fuck up and they say, hey, you know what? We've got to go electric. We've got to go nuclear in order to beat this uh oil and in order to beat this natural gas, hey, uh, building up a bunch of nuclear power plants, that could work, you know? They're, you hear them talking every day, oh yeah, listen, we're figuring out new things about fusion, fusion power. Now, personally, I don't believe that they're going to make fusion power work in my lifetime. I really don't think so. Uh, fusion power, for example, in the sun happens because you have hydrogen atoms being crushed by gravity into helium. And this happens naturally because matter basically clumps together and it creates, for the most part, gravity as it does this. And the gravity keeps getting larger and larger and larger as you have more and more matter clumping together. In this case, you're talking about hydrogen gas. Fusion happens naturally Fusion is basically like free energy. It doesn't last forever because eventually the stars burn out. But even when the stars burn out and they disperse whatever gas they have into what's called a uh, uh, planetary nebula and then maybe a stellar nursery, gravity does the exact same thing again. And it just pulls all of those gases back together and the whole process restarts itself. Fusion is a process that basically recycles itself if given enough time. But when you say time, you're talking about billions upon billions of years. So it's something that humans aren't going to see. Now, this bullshit that they're talking about, oh, yeah, we're going to take some lasers. And, you know, listen, that takes so much energy input that I just don't believe they're going to be able to really make fusion a big uh, city running power option. I don't see it happening anytime soon. Nuclear fission. Oh yeah, we got plenty of uranium and there's plenty of uranium still in the earth that we can dig up. So my thing is, it's like fission. Yeah, I could see that for the short term. Um, in my lifetime, I just don't see fusion happening. Maybe they'll prove me wrong, but I don't believe, I don't believe that they'll have sustainable uh, environmentally friendly nuclear fusion for a long time. I just don't see it. But if they do switch to nuclear fission, oh yeah, all these electric vehicles, the people fear an electric price rises and everything, not to mention we got all these solar panels and we've got wind that are uh, making huge dents in the use of fossil fuels. Um, I think, oh yeah, I think if you combine nuclear power with uh, other forms of uh, renewable energy, I really think you could 
probably be able to uh, all, all but eliminate fossil fuels. You could put some serious dents into it. But um, that's just where we are. It's like, it's, you know, it, it kind of feels like things aren't moving. But when you really look at it, things really are moving forward. It's just that they're moving forward at a very, very slow pace. Since Elon Musk is the world's richest African-American, it seems fitting that he's about to uh, honor Martin Luther King Day with a new release. Basically, it's a cheaper Model Y. Like, we've heard uh, rumors that they were planning to build a Model 2 or a cheaper, uh, smaller car than the Model 3. I don't think that they need a smaller car than the Model 3. I think it's better to simply make the Model 3 and the Model Y less expensive. So Tesla has started selling, very quietly, a cheaper Model Y, but it has a 279-mile range. And I shouldn't say that that's a big problem, because 279 miles, and even if it gets, uh, what, let's say there's a 15% loss in power and it only let's say it only gets 250 miles most people are not driving 250 miles a day nor are they driving that many miles in a week especially when you factor in the number of retirees i've always talked about my mother for example with her cadillac xt5 uh she'd had the car at this point for five years and isn't even at thirty thousand miles because she's retired. She doesn't have to go back and forth to work anymore. So there's some people with 279 miles a week. Uh, I mean, a maximum of 279 miles a week is more than enough. And then they're you know at home, so it's very easy to charge it. They just plug the thing to their house. When you're driving very, very infrequently, even charging at 110 volts, which is obviously very slow, becomes more than enough for the average person who especially who just doesn't need that much miles or range the only problem does come if someday for whatever example you absolutely do need a tremendous amount of range but for a lot of people this isn't a problem it says tesla's new entry level model y is not currently available on the site's configurator they say the electric suv is in stock at a number of tesla stores it has up to 279 miles of EPA rated range. The Model Y variant costs 2,000 less than the Model Y long range. See, in my opinion, it would be better if you could get that long range model a little bit cheaper. If that's the case, it's $2,000 cheaper, but obviously they're selling the lower capacity battery. So it says Tesla's pulling a page from In-N-Out Burger's playbook, giving Model Y buyers the chance to order a cheaper variant of a proverbial secret menu. Though the automaker's website currently restricts Model Y orders to those of the $54,380 long range or the $58,380 performance variant, Tesla's list of online inventory shows that a number of its stores are stocked with salable base Model Y EVs that wear a price tag of 2000 less than that of the long range model. So this is something if you were the type of person who's looking to get a Model Y, well, it looks like um, this is the time. Used car prices on Teslas, as I've already stated, have been falling and new car prices on Teslas have been slashed and they are also dropping. So what they're saying again is they're saying the usable capacity of these batteries falls short of the 75 kilowatt pack that powered a 2020 Model Y long range. Um, and they're saying those were rated to travel up to 316 miles on a full charge. And we managed just 220 miles of range while testing the Model Y on our 75 mile per hour highway test. Okay. Whether the range deficit of the base 2023 Model Y relative to its long range kit is worth its 2000 price reduction is a matter of personal preference. That said, the extra stacks in a base Model Y buyer's pocket can go towards added options for their new EV or a lower monthly payment 
or paying off those gambling debts. Ha ha ha. Yeah, so basically that's it. And um, see, the thing that I hope most of all with these electric cars, which probably isn't going to happen because of the fact that the technology keeps changing so quickly with all of these cars in general, the thing that I hope is that battery prices will continue to plummet. See, a lot of people want to talk about all electric cars, and I'm not defending Tesla here, but they want to talk about electric cars, be like, oh, yeah, you shouldn't buy one of those. Did you know that when the battery dies, it's $20,000? Well, the reality is that ever since these cars hit market, battery prices were high, and since then, battery prices have steadily decreased. That's because you've had a proliferation of batteries by multiple companies in multiple countries. I hope that we'll get to a point one day where we replace lithium ion batteries. But my thinking is that if they make new batteries that can replace the old batteries, it should be possible to take a lithium ion pack, take that out of the car, and to replace it with a solid state battery pack later down the road. I mean, the technology continues to change so quickly. In five years, these cars are going to look nothing like they look now. And on top of that, they're going to be better than they are now, more efficient than they are now, and faster than they are now. So I, I just feel that as the technology changes, it's just going to make things better. I mean, that's basically what happens. Technology changes, and the free market that chooses to buy this stuff picks the winners. Tesla, in some countries, specifically if you were in Norway, uh, Tesla is like the biggest seller. A lot of these island nations, for example, Teslas will eventually be the biggest seller. All they have to do is come up with a way to produce their electricity. And Tesla is ultimately going to be one of their largest sellers along with other electric cars. It's so much easier to deal with uh, these cars in a smaller environment like that, especially a controlled environment like that, because these drivers can easily charge these things, either at their homes or in some central location. So, I, I mean, we already see it happening, especially in, in parts of Europe. We already see it happening. Europe is determined at this point to go electric, especially after this Russia versus Ukraine situation. Like, for example, Russia blew up like an apartment building, I believe it was two days ago, at this point, two days ago. And because of the uh, situation where Europe and the NATO allies are no longer getting cheap Russian energy, basically, a lot of those countries, specifically India, China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, those countries are going to ally themselves ultimately with Russia and China. Southeast Asia is ultimately going to ally itself with Russia and China. And right now, the Japanese government, for example, is in tremendous danger of default. And their, their economy is falling apart because China's auto production is killing Japanese auto production. So the reality is, my bet is on China. It really is. We've already seen Japan just doesn't have what it takes to compete with China. South Korea doesn't have what it takes to compete with China. America right now is divesting itself from China as much as it can. And America is trying to bring its factory jobs back to America. In the long run, I'm okay with that because part of me is protectionist. So I think America should take care of its own first and then after that look after the rest of the world. But the people who don't want that, the corporations, they want to make maximum profit off of cheap foreign labor as long as they could. Those days are coming to an end. We are divesting from China. We are absolutely obviously divesting from Russia. But the reality is Russia and China do not need America. America only has 330 million people. Actually, I believe it's about 331. And the reality is, when you look at Southeast Asia and you look at Asia itself, you're talking about around 4 billion people. So the question is, are they really worried 
about 330 million people, more than they're worried about over 2 billion people that they can get as consumers in Africa and South America and Southeast Asia and the rest of Asia? The answer is obviously not. So the divestments, in the long run, the divestments will help America be more self-sufficient, absolutely. But the reality is China and Russia, they ain't worried about America. As much as you want to hear them talk on MSNBC and CNN about uh, how the uh, economies there are hurting, these are just the growing pains of a divestment stage. That's just what it is. So we'll see in the future who's right and who's wrong. But I'm willing to bet that uh, those countries are positioning themselves very, very well for the future. So the bottom line is Tesla may pull back a bit from China, or they may be forced to pull back from China by the U.S. government. And even if they are, they'll be able to still manufacture in other countries, specifically in South America, Africa, and other parts of Europe. I believe, in fact, I believe, and think about it like this. I've, I've told you about investing in EV stocks and lithium stocks. And I told you about that years ago. Like, that's one of the beauty. I don't bother erasing any of my videos. And I've noticed that now they're talking about lithium mining a little bit more. And the lithium mining stocks that I had told you about a long time ago, they're talking about those more and more. Who do you think is going to be required to rebuild Europe? Europe, at this point, is desperate to go electric. All of you people who can't see beyond those shitty four cylinders and six cylinders and those, you, those old aging V8s, the people who can't see beyond that are the people who are going to miss out on the money. Who do you think is going to rebuild Europe's electrical infrastructure? I'm willing to bet you the electric car companies, especially Tesla, they are going to be big in the rebuilding of these infrastructures, because now the focus is going to be on electric and self-sufficiency rather than natural gas, oil, and coal, and fossil fuels. So the reality is, for those people who mock the fact that I'm buying electric and going completely electric, understand something. I'm just ahead of the curb. It's coming one way or another. It's just coming. By law, we already know it's coming. By regulation, we already know it's coming. So my bottom line is I like to do everything early and faster than everybody else. Very little thing about me. Whenever I go to a party, whenever I go to any convention, anything that's being set up, I always get there early because when I get there earlier than everybody else, I get to make decisions that other people won't get to make. For example, I get to decide where I'm going to sit because if I get there early enough and I help set the place up, like while the people are putting chairs out and everything, I get to set up where I'm going to have my chair. When they're putting the food out, I get to see the inventory of what they've got and I get first dibs on everything because I'm early. They have a very old saying, the early bird gets the worm. Most people don't seem to understand that shit. Most people come fashionably late. Most people come late like divas. But y'all come late, but I'm already there. So that's the thing. So uh, my bottom line is, um, you know, hey, listen, if this is the direction that we're moving in, I'm just going to be at the head of the line. And that's just what it is. So um, that's that's my report for what's basically happening with the auto industry, uh, take it or leave it. All right, here's a blanket statement that I'm going to make about the stock market. There are some people who constantly ask me, where do I think they should put their money? Now, it's funny that when you go online, the first thing you're going to hear everybody say is, this is not investment advice. That's the first thing you're going to hear everybody say. Meanwhile, they say that, but then they go on to basically give investment advice. So the reality is, it's like, I'm not telling you where you should be putting your money. 
I'm only telling you what I do with my money. That's it. So um, here's a simple blanket statement. If you take a look at the 52-week lows of these uh, stocks, specifically oil and energy, and this is just one of my uh, lists of stocks that I own, Um, you've probably been with me since the video that I made, I am an oil man. I made a lot of money off of oil stock. I I consider myself like the black Daniel Plainview. But here's what I think. First of all, China had locked itself down. Because China locked itself down, their oil consumption went down tremendously. Now, they are ending the COVID quarantines and they are starting their production back up and that is ultimately going to cause fluctuations in the energy market, the oil market. The same thing also applies for Europe because as you know, uh, Europe due to the war, they had to cut back on oil because they sanctioned Russia and because they sanctioned Russia, uh, oil prices spiked And then um, through subsidies and through use of strategic petroleum oil reserves, oil prices started to go down. But the reality is, I think I just got gas about two days ago, and gas is still at $3.50. So it's still at least $1.50 more than it was during 2020 when oil prices and gas prices were at their lowest. So for people looking about places to park their money. Well, if you look at these um, energy companies, you look at BP, the 52-week low is 25, 52-week high was 36. Oxy, 31 by 77. Sunoco, 34 by 46. Shell, 44 by 61. If you look at those, and then you compare those to the actual price that we are now, one thing you'll pretty much notice is that, um, like, for instance, Oxy, it's it's only a little bit off the high. These prices, the price of the current stock of these companies is still close to the high. Like Shell, for example, 58.93 is the bid, 59 is the price, but the 52-week high is 61. That's only like, what, a $3 difference? Then look right here, 113 for Exxon which is the price, and then the 52-week high is 114. Look at Valero, 136, 146. You're only $10 off the high. My point is, oil hasn't really gone down, and neither has gas. We are still very, very close to the highs. Even Chevron, $177. Look, it's, uh, what, around $10 give or take difference from the 52-week high. Now, first of all, for those people who understand the energy market, we are currently in winter. The um, winter mix of fuel is less expensive to make than the summer mix for a very simple reason. The summer mix is designed so that it uh, creates less nitrous oxide emissions and less smog, supposedly. Therefore, the summer blend of fuels is usually going to be more expensive than the winter mix. Uh, During winter, we get less direct sunlight, and that's what ultimately causes less nitrous oxide emission. So the reality is, this is just the calm before the storm. Now, there is also the possibility that oil and energy prices are going to go down simply because we're laying so many people off. I was just reading about corporate layoffs that are happening. There's a lot of corporate layoffs planned. There's a lot of corporate layoffs happening because they're trying to improve their bottom line by laying people off so that their stock prices don't suffer. (coughs) The reality is um, there's a lot of energy companies. There's a lot of energy discovery, oil drilling that... um, should and could be invested in if you're looking for a place to park your money. So if you look at these stocks right here and their dividends, uh, well, that's their ex-div date. If you look by dividend yield, you'll see uh, energy companies such as E-Turn, E-T-R-N, 
what is it? The last price seven twenty three. The uh, fifty two week low was five eight seven, and uh, these things are still they're still relatively high. But if you're the type of person who's looking to put your money into something uh, where you could possibly definitely profit. Oil is still a decent bet. Oil and gas, they're still a decent bet. Look at the dividend yields. Sunoco, 7.37%. ETRN, 8.30%. AROC, 6.09%. WMB, 5.18%. And, and, and I think it's important for me to say something. The reality is um, you're not going to get these things as cheap as I did back in 2020. That's just, Let me just say that right away. You're not going to make as much money as I did by getting in at the ground floor. I was the one ringing the bell and telling everybody to put their money into oil and gas when everybody else was talking about fucking cryptocurrency. Uh, recently, there's been a, a fool's rally in Bitcoin because they're trying to pump it up so that they can prepare for the Binance fail, which you know a lot of people are certain is coming, or possibly the failure of the next uh, crypto ETF. I'm not even thinking about crypto anymore. The reality is crypto don't pay no dividend. And I remember when these people used to argue with me about staking coins and all that bullshit. They were, it was fun when they were talking that nonsense when Bitcoin and all those things were like $50,000. Uh, well, Bitcoin was $50,000 per Bitcoin. But now that it's literally collapsed by like more than 60%, it's like you don't hear them talking that jazz no more. So I'm not even thinking about that shit. What I can say is that for these dividend stocks, what I can say is that they haven't done me wrong. They've continued to pay back in dividend for me holding the stock. Now, a lot of my oil stock I did sell because I'm planning to buy my new electric car. But the reality is it's it's been probably in my entire life, besides real estate, oil energy stocks have been like the best place to put my money. They haven't failed. Now... The tech market has been down and is going to continue to be down until we uh, basically, until China gets back online for one. China's stocks are still hurting because of the uh, Holding Foreign Countries Accountable Act, the HFCAA Act. And, um, you know, they've, they're, they're going to come back eventually because the Chinese government is not going to allow its market to stay down. Even though the American money is probably pulled out of the Chinese market, uh, foreign investment will eventually come back to China. And when it does, uh, China's market is going to slowly start to rise again. But it's not going to do that until they fully recover themselves from the pandemic, which they obviously haven't. Okay, and then there is... I had mentioned really quickly lithium mining stock. ALB, I've noticed they've been talking about more and more. Now, I told you about these a long time ago. I never really paid much attention to them because I figured it was easier to invest in the automotive companies directly than to invest in lithium mining. Uh, but the thing about it is the uh, prices of these stocks, as you can see, ALB, for example, major in lithium mining. The 52-week low was $169. 52-week high was $334. That was pretty much at the height of the energy market because uh, when all the prices skyrocketed uh, because of uh, Russia versus Ukraine, it's like you could bet that these energy discoveries like uranium and the um, metal mining, you could bet that these things are all going to you know, eventually they're going to start to rise again. I also think, and it's funny because a lot of people were talking about uranium like years ago. Uranium is definitely going up. There's no way to absolutely secure an energy future without nuclear power. And I really believe that uranium as a commodity is definitely going to continue inching upwards. Uh, other than that, is there anything else? Uh... The tech stocks that do pay dividends, you know, the defense stocks, for example, the defense stocks have been pretty good. But the thing about it is for, for you putting your money in there and risking 
uh, $449 a share to buy Lockheed Martin or even Raytheon. Raytheon was uh, voted as one of the best stocks to uh, invest in for 2023 when I was looking at um, a Forbes, I believe it was. And um, the defense contractors in general, uh, General Dynamics, they make like the F-16, uh, you know, the defense contractors in general, they considered a good play because the belief is there's going to be various types of conflict between America and Russia or America and China. So you can't go wrong investing in um, the defense contractors. No matter what the stock price is, you still get a dividend on it. Now, Lockheed Martin is down from um, $498 as the high down to 450 Raytheon is down from 106 to 98 General Dynamics is down from 256 to 240 But as you can see, these things aren't very far away from the highs that they were during the start of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And um, me personally, if you want cheaper stocks and you want to invest without having to spend top dollar per share. I still think the best thing you can invest in is the automotive makers. When you look back to the pandemic, even the pandemic didn't stop the automakers. The automakers were retooled to make uh, PPE equipment. You can't go wrong investing in our factories. Our factories and our energy market is basically the lifeblood of the country. So as long as those factories are running, as long as the energy market is pumping, everything else is able to basically move. After all, somebody has to make these trucks. Somebody has to make these cars. Somebody has to fuel these trucks and these cars. Without that, you have no economy. So that's basically my focus. Now, a lot of people are talking on Apple, they're talking on Tesla. Oh, they're down, they're never coming back. It's like, what are you guys, dumb? It's like you guys don't learn from the past. They're down, but they're not out. They're making all of your equipment. For example, I, I said this before, Microsoft and Apple, among these other tech companies, these things are major players in the American education system. Like right now they're down because nobody feels the need to buy this equipment because, you know, uh, at-home work is pretty much uh, slowing to an end and they want people back into the offices. But the reality is these pieces of equipment have to be replaced periodically. Every four or five years, new computers have to be purchased. Every new product that gets made. Uh, like, for, you know, they were bashing Apple and they were saying, oh, yeah, well, you're not very innovative right now. Reality is, when they make something new or they make something groundbreaking, they'll get people shopping again. Same thing goes for Microsoft. Same thing goes for AMD with their processors. It's like people aren't upgrading every single year anymore. A lot of people are probably getting more use out of their products because, you know, the upgrades are so expensive. People who are first-time comers to the market, yeah, they'll buy the brand new product. But for the most part, more and more people are trying to get more use out of their products. So the tech industry is slowing down a little bit. But for the most part, it's not out. So when it comes to dividend stock for the tech industry, yeah, absolutely. But it all depends how you choose to invest your money and where you choose to invest. Uh, and the last one I'll point to is the banks. Like I had heard them talking about the banks and they were saying oh yeah well the banks oh the banks are down <clears throat> the reality is the banks may be down but obviously they're not out either look at the asks versus the how should i say the lows what is this the highs if you go to the highs and you look at the and ignore berkshire hathaway but if you look at the asks versus the highs they're not very far off you know they're down a little bit but at the end of the day, the banks are the banks. They're not going to disappear. And especially the credit card companies, MasterCard, Visa, uh, the credit card companies, they're not worried about nothing. These people aren't making money as like they were making money before. These people are spending money on their credit cards and going deeper and deeper into debt. 
So the reality is the banks, no matter what, they're going to win. Because at the end of the day, when you, could, when you need to buy a house or you need to buy a car or you need to use a credit card, at the end of the day, you're coming back to them. I would say, and I've said this always, for the person who's looking for dividend payments, for the person who's looking to park their money into a stock and get dividends over time, over a long period of time, and they're investing, maybe they're investing $100 a week or $200 a week or something, banks and oil are your best bet. They're absolutely your best bet. And pretty much all of them, all of the big banks pay dividends for the most part. So, you, you, you know, it's a, their dividend yield, like you see TD, Citibank, Citizens Financial. Like, in fact, I just got a big packet from Citizens Financial because they took over uh, Investors Bank. Like, it, it used to be called Investors Bank. Now it's called uh, Citizens Financial. But the issue is... Um, you know they make they they're paying a dividend. They're paying a four percent dividend. I have like the the money because I I used to be with what's it called Investors Bank, and now they got taken over by CFG Citizens Financial Group. I've got like over a hundred thousand dollars parked in that bank from when I was selling stock. So the issue is, um, I've already made my bets with these banks. So I'm not really worried about the banks. Long term, you ain't got nobody else to go to. Especially like if you want to buy a house or a car, who you ain't got nobody else to go to. And chances are, no matter how much cash you've saved up, you ain't got enough to buy a property without going to the bank for finance. So, you know, that's just it. Uh, banks and oil are the best possible places you can be putting your money. Now, the way I see it is, Stick with what you know. The banks that you use, the banks that you do banking with, um, those are the best ones to invest in. Most likely their stock pays a dividend. Check and see if their stock pays a dividend, and you might as well invest in them. And as far as oil companies, pick the gas or oil companies you know. Exxon, Sunoco, whatever it is, they pay a dividend. But stick with what you know, and you can't go wrong. You don't have to spread your money out that far, but if you want to diversify, that's probably the best option that you might have, especially if you're saving up towards retirement. So that's basically it. That's all I really have to talk about. So I just gave you a long soliloquy about uh, my introspection on the stock market. And... Um, so, you know, I, I told you what I'm planning to do with my money. So basically, at this point, you just have to decide what you're going to do with yours.